Well, the, uh, the convention uh, consisted of about, uh, I guess, 55 people, if you count everybody who attended. 39 of the 42 who remained in mid-September signed the document. In addition to the 55, there were 10 more who had been chosen in the states but never attended. A lot of these people were the leaders of the, in their own states. Some of them, of course, have become great names because they were at the Constitutional Convention, but many of them uh, had big reputations before they got there. The first thing they all did was to elect George Washington as president. Washington was, by all odds, the most prominent man of the highest reputation in the whole of the American nation. He was the number one colonial. The secretary was a man named William Jackson, uh, who uh, confined himself to uh, recording motions and votes, discussions, debates, and interests. There were a couple of other people who took notes, but the major notes were taken by James Madison. And Madison's notes are the source for all the events and discussions of the convention. And here they are. About half of this volume is devoted to uh, Madison's notes. Virginia also sent its governor, Edmund Randolph, sent two lawyers, one named James Mason, for whom one of the Virginia universities is named, another named George With. Neither one of those two signed the document. They declined at the end. Virginia sent James Madison, uh, maybe the most important man in the whole convention, more than any other, the author of the Constitution. Madison's a fascinating fellow, a very learned political theorist, an elitist who feared the common people. He believed in a system of separate and countervailing powers which the Constitution embodies. And at the beginning, he wanted the national government to have a veto over the states, but he couldn't get anybody to agree with him on that. New York sent uh, three people only, Alexander Hamilton, Robert Yates and John Lansing, but the last two left early because they decided the convention was about to do things that they had not been authorized to do by their instructions from the state legislature. So that left Hamilton as a minority in his own delegation, so he had no vote, but he certainly was a voluble member uh, of the convention. He's an interesting man, too. He was born in the island of Nevis in the West Indies. So he was illegitimate, and he never quite got over that. John Adams called him that bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. Not very kind, but they were never very close. Both Hamilton and Randolph had been aides to Washington during the Revolutionary War, and Hamilton continued uh, to work with Washington into the peacetime era. He wrote lots of Washington's letters and uh, speeches. And at the end, he was the principal author of Washington's uh, farewell address. He was self-taught. He went to King's College, which became Columbia, practiced law in New York, married the daughter of the governor of New York, became the first secretary of the Treasury in the established United States government. He really created the government. I don't mean the Constitution, but the government itself, the administrative system. Connecticut sent uh, Roger Sherman, the governor, and a man named Oliver Ellsworth, who became a Supreme Court justice. Massachusetts sent uh, Rufus King, uh, Governor Eldridge Gary, for whom the gerrymander, not gerrymander, but gerrymander, uh, is named. Pennsylvania sent Ben Franklin, who was the wise elder statesman. James Wilson, who was a Supreme Court justice later on. Robert Morris, who financed the revolution, and his cousin, Governor Morris, who's one of the most interesting and least known participants in the convention. Uh, Governor Morris was big and handsome. He had a peg leg. Uh, he was a bon vivant. He loved witty women. And I must say that uh, witty women generally uh, loved Governor Morris. He didn't much care what people thought of him. And he suggested, perhaps in jest, that uh, men of wealth be isolated in a branch of the Congress where others could keep an eye on them. Hamilton once bet Governor Morris a dinner 
that he wouldn't go up to George Washington and slap him on the shoulder and say, and how are you today, my dear general? Well, Morris did it, and then afterwards he said that in view of the look of reproof that Washington had given him, he wouldn't do it again for a thousand dinners. But he was an important guy, uh, Governor Morris. He was chairman of the Committee on Style. And he, he had to write out in satisfactory style all the actions and motions and resolutions that were adopted by the convention. And in doing that, he tended to let him, his own preferences uh, creep into the, the Constitution. He put in the supremacy clause, it is said, and he devised a preamble to the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, do hereby ordain in this, not we, the people of the several states, but of the United States. After the war, Governor Morris was minister of France, which he loved, uh, helped plan the Erie Canal, and he did the layout of the streets of Manhattan. New Jersey sent William Patterson, who was governor, and he also sent a man named William Livingston, a member of the Continental Congress and later on governor of New Jersey. Rhode Island sent nobody. They never took part in the convention, sent no delegates, and were the last ones to ratify the Constitution. In general, the people in the convention were young. The oldest man there was Franklin. He was 81. Uh, George Washington was 55. Nobody else was over 40. They were all well-educated. They mostly could read, and if not speak, Greek and Latin. They had read the political theorists, especially Locke and Aristotle and Montesquieu. David McCullough says they were among the best educated and most widely read men of their time. Well, the people there were a, a noteworthy group. But there were a number of people that were absent from the convention, and they are noteworthy also. John Adams is one of them. He at that time was a uh, minister in England, and the same is true of Tom Jefferson. He was minister uh, in France. John Hancock, uh, he of the large signature, uh, was governor of Massachusetts at the time, but he opposed the Constitution from scratch. Patrick Henry in Virginia, the firebrand orator, uh, he was elected, but he declined to come. He opposed the Constitution throughout. Sam Adams, second cousin or so of John, was not there, maybe too much involved in local politics in Pennsylvania, a radical in his views, and had been very strong and very active for independence even before, long before uh, the Declaration was adopted. And then finally, there was one other guy who was not there, and that was Tom Paine. Well, I suppose that's not surprising. Thomas Paine was an Englishman and had gone back to England before the revolution was over. In England, he was charged with treason because he was something of a professional revolutionary. Having been charged in England, he fled to France. In France, he was elected a member of the Revolutionary Assembly, uh, but he got in trouble, as many did, and he was about to be uh, guillotined in France when uh, the American minister intervened and got him freed, and the minister happened to be a fellow named James Monroe. Well, look back over this list of people. They are the men who gathered in Philadelphia, the men who wrote our Constitution, the men who gave character to the American nation. A doughty and noteworthy group. And next time we get together, we'll talk about how they managed to do all that.